everybody. So um, thank you guys for taking time out of your evening to join us. We really appreciate it. We appreciate your attention to um, all our emails and everything that yeah, Ann and Sarah, that Sarah and I put out at podiatrymeetings.com. So thank you very much. We are excited to bring you this um, webinar from one of our corporate sponsors, Podiatry Content Connection. They are our go-to person for online marketing for private practices. Um, and they are really the experts that we've come to know and trust. So Randy um, is kind of the face of that company and he is here to share with us his wisdom and insight and um, how we can improve our, how you guys can improve your practice online presence. All right, so um, Sarah and I are gonna mute ourselves, but we are still moderating questions. If you have questions, type them into the Q&A or the chat, and we will pause throughout the presentation so that we can address those questions. And all that being said, Randy, it's all you. All right, well, thank you very much, and thanks, <clears throat> thanks for the intro, appreciate it. Um, we're gonna be speaking about how patients really find you in 2021. So that's tonight's subject. And again, my name is Randy Rossler. I'm the National Director of Podiatry Content Connection. And if you don't know us, we're the number one uh, comprehensive digital agency for podiatrists only. <clears throat> and our slogan kind of says what we do. Uh, we help podiatrists be visible, help you connect, and help you gain new patients from the web and social media. So I wanted to start with something that most of you know, that we all live in a search society. And you know nowadays when looking for podiatrists, about 99% of the time, people will search online. And keep in mind that you know, a lot of podiatrists that I speak with say, well, I'm very fortunate, Randy, because you know we work on word of mouth and referrals. So keep in mind that even when somebody is referred to you by another doctor or an existing patient, they're gonna search you up anyway. So your goal is not to not only be visible in the places that they're searching, but ultimately is to convert that searcher into a new patient of you and your practice. So the thing is that there's really no linear path from a, <clears throat> from a prospect to a new patient. You know, when somebody begins their search for podiatrists, they begin their journey in one of many places. Of course, Google is a biggie, but it doesn't always necessarily start with Google. <clears throat> So, you know, there's many entry points and they kind of travel freely from one point to another in any particular order. So each series of steps is kind of unique. And so from patient to patient, the journey is really not always the same. Again, many people start with Google, others might start elsewhere. So the bottom line is that the patient is really the, the navigator as to where you go and when you go there. <clears throat> So I wanna share with you a couple examples of what that looks like. So we've got Jen over here who searches for podiatrists near me on Google <clears throat> and um, topping the results page is your, maybe your Google listing or a Google an ad, um, including <clears throat> the number of ratings and reviews and stars. So basically when uh, Jen would be clicking on your listing or your ad, it sends her to your website. So basically you see down below here, it starts with a Google search to a Google ad to your website. Next is Carl. So Carl asks his Facebook friends for some recommendations. So Joan, one of her friends, replies with a link to your business Facebook page. And uh, then Carl sends you a message, maybe through Facebook Messenger. So in this case, it would be like a Facebook feed to a referral to a, uh, a Facebook business page. And then, you know, Steve does a Google search on heel pain. And what comes up? Well, a blog about heel pain is listed on page one of Google because Google likes content and blogs are a great example of content that would have keywords embedded into it in a geo-targeted area. So after reading your blog, uh, Steve clicks and explores your website. So again, Google search to blog article um, to your website. And then maybe Claire finds your website through a provider directory. So then she then goes and cross checks on Google to kind of read, you know, check you out and read your reviews. She sees, you know, 4.9 stars out of five and calls your office directly to make an appointment. So again, directory to your website, so checking you out on Google reviews to a phone call. So as you can see, there's a bunch of different ways that people can make their way to you. It doesn't always come directly from Google. 
So while you really can't control where patients will go first or next for that matter, to get more information about your practice, uh, you can control your visibility and the kind of information you're putting out there and providing. So this helps patients you know, make it easier. This helps patients make their provider decision at any stop along the way, assuming you're up to date and current on, and looking good at all these different destinations. So, you know, to win in 2021, you need a, what we call a content loop that continuously refreshes and optimizes your web presence. <clears throat> So a little bit about the content loop, meaning you know, creating fresh content that is published anywhere that a new patient might be searching for you. So again, we just went over some of the ways in which they might uh, come into contact with you, with you in your practice. Now, when the world's not upside down and, and uh, we're having podiatry conferences and we're exhibiting there or I'm speaking there, we have a lot of podiatrists say, you know, I've been, I, I've been doing this a while. I have a website, so I think we're good. So, you know, a website is, well, better to have one, I guess, than not. It's almost like saying you have a, you have a business card or like saying you have a, a phone line, um, but really it's not impressive. So I want to talk a little bit more about, you know, the, really the difference between a website and a web presence. And this can make the difference between, you know, being seen occasionally online and drawing in and attracting new patients. So there's a really big difference between a website and a web presence. So a, a website is kind of like a, if you took a snapshot of your, almost like a color copy of your website and put it online, it just it's kind of idles there, it's hosted somewhere versus a web presence on the right where you have a web presence, a website in the, in the middle that with all these different things around it. So, you know, you get to see, a, you know, in order to convert a searcher to a new patient, you need to continually build your practice's visibility and relevance at each point that we just touched on. So again, whether they come to you through Google or through Facebook or through uh, content or however they find you, you want to be looking good because first impressions do count, looks count, and uh, everything counts online. We're kind of spoiled these days because we all have a supercomputer in the palm of our hand. And you know, if something is really small on a smartphone, for example, they're just gone. You know, and oftentimes you have, you have a couple seconds. Some podiatrists I meet say, you know, Randy, I'm 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 practicing maybe another five or eight, maybe nine years, and like, is it worth it? Like, why is a web presence even worth building at this stage of the game? I'm at this 25 or 28 years. You know, wh why now? And the reason is money, you know, and also to s serve your patient base and your community better. So, but there is a lot of money in, in the value of a new patient. So we've asked about 4,000 podiatrists that we've met over the last seven and a half years at your podiatry conferences. And we, if you've met us there, you're always filling out one of our surveys and you know that this is one of our questions. So we always ask how much is one new patient worth to your practice? Uh, over the first year, meaning initial visit, follow-up visits, uh, procedures, services, repeats, referrals, et cetera. Um, and the average we hear, it really depends on the, the nature of your practice and where you're located. But typically, the average we're hearing in the United States is about $1,000 over that first year. Of course, that does not include lifetime value, but $1,000 for one new patient in the first year. So the thing is that a web presence is really never finished because this continuous optimization of each entry point is really crucial to strategically help you compete in competitive markets. So, you know, it's one thing to be visible. It's another thing to get them to your website, which is the hub of your web presence. It's another thing to get them in, draw them in, engage them, and get them to do something like either fill out an appointment page or uh, click on a button to call your office or pick up the phone and call your office. That's when the kind of the rubber meets the road, so to speak. So there's a, a bunch of different entry points that should be optimized. So of course your website is the hub of all this. So, you know, it's really at the middle of everything. And so it's surrounded by content and directories and social media and all that good stuff. We'll talk more about that. Um, I mentioned about a moment ago that, you know, believe it or not, the clock is ticking. So if you've got about literally two to 10 seconds to engage website visitors, and that's very little time. So, you know, being that 80% of, uh, website searches or more than that are done on, on mobile phones, you know, with a much smaller screen. If your website is not responsive and doesn't come up well on mobile phones, it's going to be tiny. And then, you know, in, in that, in the course of those two or three seconds, you just lost a prospective new patient that could be yours, but now they're clicking away because there's other choices. And so again, two to 10 seconds to engage visitors. 
And then you want to have, you know, basic information about the kind of like the who, what, where, why of the practice. It really should be obvious on the homepage without having to really search. Because again, people have the attention span of a fly. And so, you know, recognize that when people are coming to your website, there's other things coming at them, whether it's phone calls, text messages, et cetera. You want to find what they're looking for right away. And so buttons like this during COVID, you want to see <clears throat> buttons for COVID statements, precautions for coronavirus. Um, if I woke up and my heel is killing me, I want to see a button that speaks to common you know, concerns like heel pain treatment or foot pain. I've seen a lot of websites that are really very pretty, you know, podiatry websites. They've got waterfalls and feet running through the water. It's really kind of cool. Thing is that where's, where's heel pain treatment? Where's foot and ankle pain? And you have to go to a, maybe a tab somewhere and then click and then click again. So it's two or three clicks later, you might find what you're looking for or not. So you want to be able to, you know, meet them where they are and right at the front fold, be able to highlight, you know, these important things and make it easy for somebody to schedule an appointment. The younger generation, by the way, they don't want to be on hold for a minute or two. They're just going to hang up. So they want to go click on a button and request an appointment or schedule one. <clears throat> and so your website really should educate patients while also helping you rank in the Google search. So content is a great tool for that. And you want to, you know, your website content needs to be fresh updated and, and engaging to users. Um, now this has not arrived as of yet, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, you know, it's, I believe it's coming out the beginning of May, which is not far away, but another algorithm change for Google is gonna really measure how fast your website loads. Um, and not only just the, the website itself, but even pages within your website. So these are all scores by Google. And if you're not, just like if you're not mobile friendly or responsive, you'll be less visible through Google. Same thing here. Um, and again, being mobile responsive. So meaning that your website will look great on whether it's a, a laptop, a desktop, an iMac, uh, you know, or of course a cell phone or a mobile phone. So it's gonna work with all of those. So it's adjustable. And so all these things count, you know, being mobile friendly, being fast, being ADA compliant, so you don't get a $75,000 fine um, to be secure. How many, you know, times have you seen a website <clears throat> that says not secure? It's really a big deal because people are so concerned about, you know, malware and viruses, et cetera. So they, you know, if it's not a secure website, many of them are running for the hills. <clears throat> So, you know, if your site is easy to use, it's attractive, it answers questions, you know, most immediate questions, and has clear calls to action, most likely potential patients, they're gonna book appointments because everything looks good. And also all of these engaging website enhancements are very good to please Google as well, which is a good thing. Then there's Google search. Obviously one of the most popular entry points is a Google search. Um, so every podiatrist I speak to, of course, where do they want to be? They want to be on page one of Google, not on page two, not on page three. Um, it reminds me of the old show with Maxwell Smart, missed it by that much. If you missed it by that much, meaning showing up on page two of Google, you missed it by a lot because most of the action I ask everybody here, you know, how often do you ever make it past page one of Google? Because uh, there's so much information there but there's not enough real estate for all the podiatrists in that area to fit there. So if you're showing up on page two or three or four of Google, you're essentially invisible. So when somebody types heel pain in your city or town, you wanna to show up at least once if not multiple times. <clears throat> so one of our customers, Dr. Richard Silverstein, um, you know, he's showing up very well in a bunch of different searches, but you know, the Google factors in all these different optimizations and the rankings that they really decide who gets listed on page one. So he's listed a lot because he's got fresh content on a regular basis with frequent search engine ind indexing. Um, and we know that Google loves content, Google loves frequent, frequent updates of content. Um, and the more content and more keywords and key phrases that you have, the better. And so fresh content really increases your authority potential and um, you know, it keeps your audience informed and updated. I've seen so many podiatrists that have a, a blog symbol, for example, on their website and I click on it and it's, you know, the, the most recent blog is from two and a half years ago, not really updated content. And so, you know, consistently updating and developing what I call properly SEO content can dramatically improve how search engines, you know, see your practice 
And this is just another example of it. Dr. Silverstein, who's at Union Foot Care, put in, you know, uh, heel pain in Harve de Grasse, Maryland, which is where he's located. Um, he's showing up, you know, one, you know, four or five times or more on the front top fold of page one of Google, which is a great thing because that's where you want to be. Hey, Randy, we've got a couple questions real quick. Sure. The first one is, how often does content need to be updated? Hmm. That's a good question. Well, the more often, the better. I mean, I see some websites have no content at all, meaning no like blogs or articles or anything other than the, the templates on their website. So that that's, I mean, that's not great. I see other podiatrists that have um, content on a, um, you know, a couple times a year. And a lot of times when we meet podiatrists say, you know what, I'm, I, I can write this stuff. I'm a good writer. I'm knowledgeable. Nobody know, knows what I do. So I'm going to put it out there. And I said, we, I've seen that movie before. I wish you good luck with that because it never happens because we all get too busy. So we have a staff of that. So if they do it once in a while, that's okay. Other podiatrists, we see that they have a, <clears throat> a blog on a, actually on a monthly basis, which is not bad. <clears throat> what we do, I mean, Granted, it's our middle name, Podiatry Content Connection. So we have a full team of writers in-house. And all they do is research and write blogs for every one of our customers every single week. So it's a major undertaking, but it pays big dividends. So my answer to your question is that the more, more is better. So we do a, a blog every single week, uh, but we don't stop there. We do a blog and each blog has a, what we call a companion article that's linked to that blog that's a little bit more clinical. So it's actually two pieces of content every single week. And that's, so that's about, about eight pieces per month. Um, and we're, but, but wait, there's more, you know, we do more than that. Um, we added a couple of years ago, something called spot campaigns that have less content, but greater visuals with call to actions on them. So we mix those in with, with the, uh, the blogs. And it's been amazing as far as click through ratios that are coming through on those um, to help people. You know, we found that unfortunately, a lot of podiatrists are what I call pigeonholed. So if you're the doctor that clips their nails, that's what they tend to remember you for and don't really understand the full scope of your practice and your work. So we hate to see them go to an orthopedic surgeon for something that you could do or drive to um, Walmart to Dr. Scholl's kiosk when you should be fitting them for custom orthotics. So we find that spot campaigns are visual ways to remind people above and beyond the blogs, instead of just educational content, to remind them through visuals with a call to action that it's time for, to check your orthotics or um, diabetic foot screenings, et cetera. But again, um, more is better. So if you do it on a weekly yeah. basis, that's awesome. And then do you still have to buy Google AdWords? No, you don't have, oh, you mean, it, assuming you have all this wonderful content and it's performing well, do you still need Google AdWords? Um, you don't have to do anything. And Google AdWords is what I call the, in many cases, the deeper end of the pool. Um, it's more money. You have to have a budget for Google. Um, I would ask a lot of you to, when you're doing a search for something, how often do you read the ads or do you skip past them? <clears throat> so I am a proponent of Google ads and they're, there's nothing more powerful than Google ads, but it's really great to have the best of both worlds where you can have um, uh, content that is organic, like you're seeing here, right, right here for, um, for Dr. Silverstein, it's all organic, although he does advertise with us, um, but you're not looking at it. Um, so you, and we also backfill. So as great as the content is, uh, first of all, content is ma not a magic pill. If we have a new customer that starts with us, and we're doing the blogs every week, which we do right out of the gate. Um, it's not like the floodgates open in the first week or month, because that doesn't happen. Um, it really takes some time, at least, I mean, not that much time, but at least a couple months, like two months minimum, uh, before the content starts registering on Google and starts what I call kind of percolating. Uh, but two, three months in, you start to see it happen. And so it's great when you have organic content, but there might be some things that you're not pulling as well for, and that's what Google Ads is. There's nothing like Google Ads for that uh, done right. So again, I've seen podiatrists try it on their own, and I always say, don't try this at home because there's math and science and a lot of marketing and testing and tweaking in Google Ads. Okay, great. And then there's another one here. Um, you may want to address this via email later on, but what is the cost to set up a website? Uh, mm -hmm. Also, word of mouth is still a great source for my practice and websites can be pricey and monthly fees to maintain the website can be costly too. 
Do you have any kind of response yeah. for that right now? Yeah, well, I would say that, um, you know, it really, it depends on where you're coming from. If you view this as a, as a website, as, a, as an expense, um, it's not the way to think about it. I mean, uh, if you're in private practice, uh, it's another way of saying you, have, you run your own business. And any entrepreneur, a successful entrepreneur or business owner would tell you that you want to outsource and delegate things. And also that, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're a podiatrist or a plumber or an accountant. Um, marketing is the lifeblood of any business. And now in a, in a time like when it's COVID-19, <clears throat> when people, you know, we've seen two different types of podiatrists. Some are, you know, are what I call duck and cover. They're ducking, they're hiding under the table until this storm passes. And they've been waiting for it to pass for a year now and they're still in pause mode. And guess what? They're in a tailspin. They're in bad shape. A lot of podiatrists are still 20, 30, 40% down from where they were uh, beginning of, of, of 2020. Uh, on the other hand, the flip side is other podiatrists are recognizing this as an opportunity uh, that they need to, um, in many cases, follow our leads and, and strategies is to adapt and pivot and do things differently. So back to your question, um, if you view this as an expense, then it's kind of like, if, if that's where you view it, I would encourage you to view it as an investment. The bottom line is really the bottom line, does it work? I mean, um, most eyeballs are on the web. So if you're not investing money into online marketing, whether it's a company like us or somebody else, um, where are you putting, are you putting in the yellow pages? You know, that's the thing of the past. Uh, many, not all of our customers, but so many of them are seeing five, eight, 10 times return on investment. If somebody's seeing, say, you know, eight times return on investment or six times return on investment for that matter, is that an expense? No, it's an investment because they're, you know, they're investing whatever they are, and then they're seeing multiples of that come back. So it's, it's really a mindset. And if you want to get good at something, you don't want to be a, a best kept secret. Marketing is a thing that makes you visible. And, you know, we've seen a lot of podiatrists that are, you know, have written books, they've created uh, new platforms, but they, they're just dinosaurs when it comes to marketing. And you have younger uh, podiatrists just graduating, but grew up with the internet and social media and kind of whiz, you know, whiz past them. So you don't want to be in that bucket. You want to, you know, recognize the, the power of online marketing. And most of our customers, once they get to that point, they see these types of return on investment, they no, no longer view it as an expense and they pay close attention to it. Okay, super. We've got a couple more, but I'm gonna hold them until a bit later to get let you get a little bit further on. Sounds good. Okay. So, you know, I normally recommend, like I mentioned before, because we have a model that works. We've kind of cracked the code on this stuff. Again, our company name is Podiatry Content Connection. So we recommend what's worked for us is that, you know, that podiatrists publish two pieces of quality content to the website every week. <clears throat> so then that's um, a blog and an article. Um, easier said than done, but that's what we recommend. <clears throat> And um, Google indexes new content and displays blogs and articles in a search. So um, they tend to increase exposure, uh, really help with your visibility and your credibility. Um, so while using you know, Google search, potential patients are also likely to find your practice's reputation score and review star. So if you put in something like this into Google <clears throat> and says um, podiatrist in New Jersey, you know, you'll list a bunch of podiatrists in New Jersey and you're going to see like this first one is uh, 4.3 stars out of five. Not bad. 48 reviews. Pretty good. Um, when you scroll down, but then you see another one here that has, you know, 3.1 stars and only eight reviews. Not as good. Not as many reviews. Not as good a ranking. So these all play an important role. Um, many of you, I'm sure, know Jeffrey Learman. He let me borrow this slide. He shared this with me, saying that 85% you know, of patients or prospective patients, they make judgments based on what they see and read online. <clears throat> so, you know, that's important. And uh, another entry point are these directory sites and review sites. So, you know, when, you, when your directory listings, and the, we refer to as NAP, like your name, address, and phone number are correct, complete and consistent across the web, they become a, an asset and a powerful way to optimize your visibility and increase conversions. Um, we have a, a website that I encourage you to go to, but not now, but you might want to jot this down, uh, foundonpage1.com. So it's the number one. So it's uh, foundonpage1.com. And you can actually fill out, uh, run your own report to see if you actually have listings and if it's all updated, which is great. 
or if there's errors, it'll let you know how many you have. And if you have errors, you should be speaking with us uh, because this is something that ties into, you know, SEO, you know, search engine optimization, otherwise known as showing up more often on Google. Um, so we want to, you know, claim these listings and really keep them updated. And that's what we do through people, our teams and software. So build a solid reputation and a steady flow of referrals on review sites can really help you build and sustain a, success, a successful practice. Um, now we all want to say how great we are, but what other people say about you is really important. So, you know, for those of you, you know, if you've Googled yourself and you see that you've got three stars, you know, three stars is not good enough. Uh, this is one of our recent campaigns um, talking about cranky Karen. Any cranky Karen having a bad day can give you a bad review. So, I mean, and by the way, as I'm sure many of you know, that has nothing to do with you. <clears throat> it's basically maybe they had to wait too long in the waiting room or there's a problem with the insurance and they got upset and they gave you a bad review based on an emotional response. Um, nothing to do in many cases by the quality of your care. But bottom line is that three stars is dangerous and can have a really negative impact on your practice. So this is critically important is um, how many reviews you have and, and you want to have at least, you know, four plus stars is a beautiful thing. You got to love this kid here. And, um, but positive reviews are a very big deal. And, you know, this become a more and more important, you know, like when I shop on Amazon, I could be shopping for a pair of socks, um, nothing major, but if, um, I see that you know 83% of those users rated it two stars. I'm not buying that pair of socks. So you know, and when we're talking about visiting a podiatrist, we're not talking about you know socks or maybe diabetic socks, but really somebody working on your foot or your ankle. It's important. So reviews are critical. And if you don't have enough reviews and you're and you're in the three range, that's a danger zone. Then there is social media. So, you know, social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter really help you gain more exposure for your website's blogs and articles and other things that you can kind of cross post. So they kind of point back and forth to each other and they give users a better picture of your practice. Now, a lot of practices I see, <clears throat> they get very playful on Facebook, for example. Uh, some of it's kind of like very salesy, uh, hokey, um, promoting stuff, which is okay to a certain extent, but I, you know, we're believers in educational content sent to your website, Facebook, and Twitter uh, consistently is much more professional. It adds more credibility. Um, but Facebook is also a great platform to offer, you know, useful information, whether it be blogs and stuff like that, share referrals, uh, and become known to a potential patient uh, to kind of get onto your radar. And then Twitter also, another important social media channel that can educate viewers and help new patients really find your practice. And then of course, content we mentioned before is really critical. Um, so we call it the content loop must be frequently refreshed with new content at every online entry point. So whether that's topical blogs, reviews, articles, um, updates to your website about your practice, um, all comes into play. <clears throat> now, Bill Gates always says, you know, content is king, but especially on the web, it's a very big deal. Um, in our world, podiatry content connection, you know, it's like our secret sauce, I call it, because good, consistent content, in our case, on a weekly basis, is vital to being seen and staying on page one of Google, which again, it's a tall order. Everybody wants to be there, but most podiatrists are not there. And if you're there one time, it's better than not being there. But through, you know, content, for example, done right, can get you there multiple times, like the example I showed you before. So, you know, blogs are a great tool because they're, you know, the blogs are uh, simple to read. Uh, they're written for laymen. They're not written for podiatrists. They're written for people that have foot problems. And just a collection of short, engaging posts about foot and ankle conditions. In many cases, we link it to uh, lifestyles or sports and celebrities. So, you know, if Jennifer Lopez slipped during the Super Bowl and, you know, twisted her ankle, that would be a great example of a celebrity in the news with a foot and ankle condition, you know. Um, and then I will always have links back to your website and an appointment page. So it's also important that the blogs contain what I would call calls to action, whether that be <clears throat> the practice name uh, and or the name of the doctor or doctors. So links in it. And, uh, 
you know, there are ways that blogs can help promote you and your practice. So, you know, it really leads patients that are seeking podiatric information. We all know that, you know, in many cases when people are searching for doctors, they're Googling stuff and doing some due diligence before, sometimes during, and sometimes after a visit to your office. So you wanna lead them to you through podiatric content. And it also, you know, serves up your, you know, your knowledge, you know, they establish you as an authority and fosters trust. And, uh, you know, content, whether it be blogs or like we have the video library we offer is another way to engage, I call it stickiness, to engage. Because when you go to a podiatrist website, in many cases, a lot of what I call plain vanilla ones are, it's like electronic business card. This is who we are. This is the doctor. This is the college you went to. Uh, this is where we're located and this is which insurance we accept. Um, but it doesn't provide a ton of information. So blogs are educational content. When people have a concern about that, they like to read more about, about that. And you know, when patients feel kind of like validated when they read or see something on a blog or an article about a particular problem, and it kind of yells out to them, like people who have these particular issues are welcome in my practice. Like we recognize this and we can help you. Um, so they educate you, they inspire people to pick up the phone and call you. And they just get a good first impression. These guys look good, they're up to date, um, get great information, great reviews. What else do I need? I'm picking up the phone, I'm calling them. And that's where kind of the rubber meets the road. So, and then with all that said, blogs are really important to Google because Google loves content. So you want Google to kind of fall in love with you based on good, consistent podiatric content that has keywords and key phrases embedded into your blogs and articles on a weekly basis is a very big deal. So I'm talking a whole lot about blogs and articles and directories and social media and optimization and this and that. So, so for some of you it might be, this is like I'm speaking Hungarian. Um, what does it really all mean? You know, so the bottom line is that, you know, we live in the, in the digital age and the battle for new patients really takes place online. <clears throat> so you want to win that digital battle. I mean, that's really the bottom line. That's where this all takes place. So to be what I call an online superhero, um, to attract new patients and more what I call ideal patients, the types of patients you'd like to attract, that you like to treat best. Um, to attract those, you need a great looking website that's easy to navigate, that's easy to find things, um, with fresh content that sheds light on the visitor's uh, concern, with um, directories so they can find you and not one of your competitors by mistake, um, and then, of course, last but certainly not least, is that you want to have a stellar online reputation. So you have a, a lot of good reviews and at a heart, you know, whether it's five stars or 4.6, 4.8, even 4.5. But if you have 3.5 stars and you have, you know, 10 or 20 reviews, that's not a good thing. And by the way, if you have um, even if you have like, say, 10 Google reviews and at five stars, which is not bad but it's really not great because all it takes is a couple disgruntled patients to give you a one or two star rating. And suddenly that those five stars are now at a three point something or, you know, so it's not good. So again, all this great looking website, updated content, updated directories and managed reputation really makes it for a game changer for most of our customers that came to us with a, what I call an average plain vanilla website. And we can help them build out a, an effective web presence that you know they never look back. I mean, that's one of the reasons that our retention rate is over 90% with our customer base because they're seeing results that they never thought. And I should mention, by the way, that most of our customers, I'd say, I don't know exactly, between 75 and 80% of our customer base um, is what I call the baby boomers. They've been practicing at least 20 years, sometimes 30 years, and have a pretty decent practice, but Frankly, they're just not where they thought they would be 25 or 30 years out. They're doing okay, but they like to do better. And they know at some level that they should and could be utilizing the web and social media to grow their practice and watch others do it. But they never knew like where to get started. And they're wondering, I only have seven more years left. Is it worth it? And my, my, my answer would be it absolutely is. It makes a big difference to help you and your practice and better serve your community. So... Again, I shared a lot of information with you guys and I appreciate your time on this. So don't get blown away by what I call information overload because our company is set up, um, besides the fact that we only do, you know, and work and serve podiatrists, 
we do it all for you. So this, what we do is not a self-service model. There's a lot of great gurus out there who have talked to you about do this and do that, but at the end of the day, who's got the time to do it? So we've got the time, the staff, and the expertise, and we do it all for you. So a lot of our customers, some of these, by the way, are recent reviews on Google. Um, so we appreciate that. And, uh, you know, they talk about how we understand marketing, how we understand podiatry. Um, Dr. Spinner over here said they, you trip, uh, they've increased my exposure with an excellent website and responsible for a 35% growth in my new patient consults. That's pretty good. Um, Dr. Shalev say how we basically you know, go above and beyond to help them. He actually has some issues that we help them with. And then Dr. Manger saying that, you know, he's worked well with his investment, uh, increased his exposure, um, increased the number of new patients he's seeing weekly. So he recommends it. So we appreciate that. And we love hearing from our customers and we speak with our customers on a regular basis, which is one of the things that really our customers appreciate. So with that, um, this is really important. I want you to think about what we covered tonight and relative to your practice. So how do you think your practice looks these days? Have you really taken a look at it? Like where do you stand relative to your competition within a, say a 10 mile radius of your office? Where do you stand? Are you part of what I call the 1% club? Uh, many of our customers are, and it's a great place to be. Um, and then, you know, with COVID and so forth in mind, how can you pivot during tough times? A lot of our customers have done this. We've been working with them uh, since last March and done some amazing things to help them change and pivot and adapt. And they've come out way ahead. So it's a great thing. So if you haven't done that, I encourage you to think about it. Um, and so, you know, it's early on in the new year. So you know, a lot of business owners think about what, what they're going to do for their business for the new year and how things will be different and this new normal they keep talking about. So <clears throat> it says here that hope is not a strategy and it's true. So the question is, do you really have a strategy when it comes to how to grow your practice by utilizing and leveraging the power of the web and social media? Um, because if you don't, I encourage you to take advantage of us because that's our area of expertise and I encourage you to, you know, schedule a free strategy session with us um, because at the very least you'll gain clarity about, you know, where you're at and how you look relative to your competition. Uh, th simple things that you could be doing. Most people that I speak with are pleasantly surprised at what we do, how we do it, and it's much less than they thought it would ever cost them. Um, so it becomes kind of a no brainer when they see it. But a lot of people are just not sure who to speak to. But we have a, again, we're, we only serve podiatrists. We're really advocates to help you guys succeed. Um, so I encourage you to, um, my email address is up here, um, Randy Rossler at podiatrycc.com. You can text or uh, call me at 917 572 5088. I'm on the East Coast, by the way, so please don't call me at three in the morning. But um, my number again, 917-572-5088. And if you haven't checked out our website yet, we're at Podi uh, Podiatry CC, which stands for Content Connection. So it's uh, www.podiatrycc.com. And um, that's what I got. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. But we've had a you know a great. Um, year, even last year, helping a lot of podiatrists through COVID and done some great things. And for a small business with about 40 some odd people, we've really made our mark in the podiatry industry. And we're looking forward to doing a lot more going forward. So I really appreciate your time. Have, um, Randy, we have several questions that have come in. <laughs> sure, no problem. Okay. So is it better to host a blog on your website or on an independent blog mm -hmm. site? I'd say it's better to host it on your website because it's going to give your website with all the other uh, things that you're doing. Um, yeah, the, the, again, the website is a hub of your web presence, so everything's there. And your website should be attached to social media, the directories, everything points to your website as a hub. So I would say for sure that should be attached to your website. Okay. Is your company, is Podiatry Content Connection picking the topics of the articles and blogs, or is there an exchange of ideas and topics driving in the direction of the practice? That's a great question. So uh, we're not cookie cutter, so to speak. So every practice is different. 
So for example, some are more progressive than others. Some do shockwave and laser, um, others don't. Some are big on surgery, some don't do surgery. Um, so depending on whatever your profit centers are and whatever an ideal patient looks for you, looks like for you, um, every practice is different. So the content and the look and feel of your website will be different, but the content and the messaging will be congruent with whatever makes you guys, uh, whatever it works for you. And, you know, it's, it is communication back and forth. One of the ways that we keep our customers, and I mentioned over 90% of them, uh, as far as a retention rate is, well, you gotta have a great service, that's part of it. But the other part is communication, that we have review calls at no additional cost to really get to know our customers. And we know our customers on a first name basis, we have senior level marketing uh, strategists that work with our customers. So you're not getting the, uh, you know, the rep of the week, you're getting somebody that's been with us for a while that knows your account. Um, and that's really, really important. And I should mention, by the way, that some, you know, there's different variations and there's no right or wrong. Some podiatrists have really, they don't even have a website. So they're just getting onto it. So just, you know, getting a website when you never have one is a game changer in itself. But there, there's a lot of podiatrists and majority of them have already, of course, had a website. They have a website, but they have an older outdated one. Um, and then there's another group that has a, an updated website. Um, they've been with two or three different companies and I won't name them, but then they find the way to us and they stick with us because, you know, um, we have a certain level of service that is excellent and, um, you know, finding the right company that can provide and keep the promises and has an open line of communication when you need them is a very big deal because marketing is, again, is a critical component of running your business. It doesn't matter what business you're at. So communication is big and we put your messaging, whatever it's relevant to you, that's what we bring forward on the web. Okay. Um, should I reply to good reviews to thank them for the kind review? Well, I do. Um, I love when we get good reviews. I, I often uh, pick up the phone and, and call our customers and thank them for that. So I think it's, it's a nice thing to do. Um, as a matter of fact, I did it today. Um, uh, I was actually trying to get my son a COVID um, uh, vaccine. And I, the place that we went to, was so great and I actually give, gave them a five-star review on Google about two weeks ago and uh, I told her that today and she was so thankful uh, that I did that so people like to be recognized for that but I think it's a great idea if you can do that it's an excellent practice to get into. Awesome. Do you have a method for filtering negative reviews as you gain web presence? Do you have a method for filtering negative reviews? Well, it's a little bit of a tricky question. A lot of people ask me, can we kind of, you know, these reviews are bogus, they're not accurate. Um, and so we just, can we make them go away? And unfortunately the answer is no. Um, what you want to do is really push them down and smother them with more positive reviews. I should mention, by the way, reviews are SEO friendly. So uh, a positive review or a negative review could come up you know, on Google when people are searching. So you want to have a whole lot more uh, positive than negative. Good point. Is yep. it worth it to do lost and follow up where you courtesy call patients you saw six months ago just to see if they want to follow up or not? That's a great, these are great questions, by the way. So it's good. I'm happy people listening and they're really good questions. So um, absolutely. I mean, we have systems that utilize, um, actually they utilize AI, like artificial intelligence for similar to like a constant contact type email system. So if you collect emails of your patients, you might have uh, uh, active patients, but also dormant patients. So folks that you haven't seen in six months or a year, but you know what they say, out of sight, out of mind. So you want to get them back in the office because if they're not coming to you and they're having foot problems, they're going somewhere else. Why not get them back in? Okay. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and then one little thought here. I was always taught, get your house, i.e. office cleaned up first and find a niche. Um, he said thoughts on that you know, just finding a niche and cleaning up your office first. Right. Uh -huh. um, well, I mean, finding a, a niche is definitely good. I mean, uh, a lot of uh, some of our customers, and this comes up in our strategy sessions and in our review calls with our customers, they, um, some of them suffer from what I call entrepreneur's disease, meaning that they're all over the place and they want to target like, like 10 different things. And we have to coach them, say, become more narrow. 
let's try one or maybe two things and tweak it and test it until we get it right and then scale it. So we've had great success doing that. I would often caution podiatrists that are basically um, trying a bunch of different things at once, especially if they're trying it themselves, very dangerous. So um, yes, gotta be Sarah careful. and I are familiar with entrepreneur's disease. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So we've got a couple more here. Sure. Um, you kind of already addressed this one, but I want to make sure it get, gets asked. Are the blogs the same for each doctor? It's a good question. So um, the answer is no. The blogs are not the same for each doctor, but let me just clarify that. So uh, is it possible if one of our customers is located in Edison, New Jersey, we're doing a blog on heel pain. First of all, there's only so many ways to describe or talk about heel pain, but is it possible that that blog uh, on heel pain for this customer in Edison, New Jersey, would anybody else in the state of New Jersey ever have that blog, especially like this month or next month? The answer is no. Uh, that being said, um, is it possible that blog could actually show up with another doctor in Dallas, Texas? And the answer is yes. And we've never had a problem with this. Some of our cust- uh, some of our competitors say, "Oh, you know, they have this, we've seen the same blog elsewhere." But we have a massive arsenal of of content, and we have a full staff of writers that all they do is research and write blogs for every one of our customers every single week. So between the staff and the writing and the software that's specifically designed to prevent that from ever happening, that no two podiatrists will ever have the same content um, is a big deal. So we take protective measures to make sure that um, you know our customers are uh, not looking exactly the same and that their blogs are not exactly the same. But again, that blog in Edison, New Jersey, theoretically could show up in a state far, far away, but it wouldn't even matter. Okay. Uh, how well do social media sites work if you do not invest in Google ads? You mean, are you referring to advertising? Like in, if you don't do Google ads, but like Facebook ads? Sure. Yeah. So, um, well, I'll just say there's nothing like Google. You can think about it because you're literally typing in heel pain treatment at us in New Jersey and boom, your practice pops up immediately. So there's nothing like that. There's, you know, show. So Facebook is great also because Facebook and Google have so much information. So for example, if a podiatrist wants to target maybe a younger audience, wants to go after sports injuries or uh, dancers or runners, so let's say runners, um, we could, through Facebook, you know, they know your age, your income, your, your, what you like. So we could target for you runners within a certain radius of your office that subscribe to running magazine that have all these different credentials to really laser focus on them. So it's a great way to, 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 uh, to do that. But keep in mind that um, Facebook is a social network. So you're kind of checking out your um, friends' birthdays and seeing who's doing what, and all of a sudden an ad for a podiatrist pops up. So it's what I call interruption marketing. It does work and the budgets are significantly less than Google. But most of our customers that are winning big, I mentioned before, that are seeing eight and 10 times return on investment, they're, they're using Google. They're not, I mean, and if they're doing a Facebook budget, which many of them are, it's a fraction of what the Google is because Google is where we're seeing tremendous returns on investment. And typically they're tracking it and they're bumping up their budgets over time because they're, I don't want to say laughing all the way at the bank, but yeah, the return on investment is huge and they're seeing it working. And again, I mentioned entrepreneur's disease. We're not starting with 20 different variations. We're starting with one or two and we scale it from there. Okay. Do you do Instagram ads? We do not. Okay. So some of our customers are big on Instagram for a younger audience. So they could, many of them take our blogs and they have a way of linking it to that, but we don't stream or push to um, Instagram or, or okay. um, LinkedIn. Right. And then uh, one more question here. By the way, guys, if you're still with us, which many of you are, if you have any questions, type them into either the chat or the Q&A, and we're going to stick around for a few more minutes and answer any questions. Uh, this one says, just a comment. I've had a couple nasty one-star reviews, and I call the patient after I see it to address their problem. Right. Both of them removed the review because they were blown away that I'd call them. That's a really good Tip. <laughs> that's a that's a great tip, and uh, you know, so if it's not confrontational, if you handle it the right way, it's a practice management thing. I mean, done tactfully, um, that is a great thing. I mean, you have nothing to lose, and if you're empathetic and you're listening and you're apologetic, um, that can go a long way. So I think that's great. Awesome. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna 
keep an eye on Q and A and chat for just a few more minutes here, just to see okay. if anybody has any questions. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you, Randy, for taking the time to do this for us um, and our audience. And thank you to everybody who joined us live today. Um, Sarah mentioned earlier, you guys are all entered to win a $900 shopping spree with our nice. virtual sponsors. So you could spend some of your cash winnings with Randy getting started. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, again, just thanks to everybody for just paying attention to what we put out there. And if anybody ever has any special requests or things that they would like to see from us or from our corporate sponsors, we'd love to hear about it because we're always looking for something new to offer. Sarah, what you got? Uh, yep, I totally agree. So definitely, as soon as you're done here, um, reach out to Randy with your specific questions on how he can help your practice with digital marketing. And then as soon as you're done, pop over to podiatrymeetings.com, get entered for that shopping spree, and then um, stay tuned because we do have two more webinars from our podiatrymeetings.com sponsors later this month including uh, the Remy Laser, as well as McLean Labs Pathology. So it's going to be a really exciting month of education from our sponsors. And Randy, thank you so much. Um, I you. actually was getting not only with the, the chat that we've got going on, but people who know me personally are texting me throughout the presentation are um, commenting that this was an excellent webinar, very educational. And for this being our first sponsor webinar from podiatrymeetings.com, um, it was a great one to start off with. Everyone is excited about the most up and coming and, and new information and in marketing, because like you said, everyone here is a small business owner right. and um, digital presence is everything. So that was an, a really strong presentation. And I really, really thank you for taking the time to be yeah. here for us. Yeah. Oh, I appreciate we do have yeah. one yeah. more question that just popped in. It says, what sure. do you think about using newsletters for advertisement? You mean like putting them in the mail? Well, I would assume they mean like email newsletters, but yeah. let's talk both. Well, I mean, I'm a, I'm a fan of what they call guerrilla marketing. You know, you try a bunch of different things. I mean, online is where the eyeballs are at. So uh, I, I, I don't think you could compare a, a newsletter that goes out through the mail or even through email uh, to, you know, blogs updated on a weekly basis. But that being said, I think that if you have a nice newsletter, and, and you can get it to your audience, that's great. And some people do like to, you know, just like some people still like reading the New York Times on the weekend or opening up a magazine, they like a, a printed piece and the, you know, they look at it closer. So that's not a bad idea. And if you have a decent sized email list, um, and that's important by the way, is the number. So if you have a, an email list with 75 people on it, that's really very small. If you have a, an email list with, with uh, 7,000 people on it, that's a different story. So, but, okay. it, but I, I think it's good. And again, it's educational content. But the, the thing with the web is when you put educational content on your website, combining it with keywords and key phrases that are embedded into these blogs and articles that, that help you show up on Google, that is a, that's a powerful thing. So. Good. I really appreciated you mentioning that Google plans on changing the way their algorithm works. Um, for, and you know it's going to favor websites that load faster because right. Sarah and I really need to get on the ball with that. Yeah. <laughs> we need to make that a priority. Yeah. Well, you know, Google is always making us jump through hoops. So we have a uh, we have a team that works with Google, and so we're always trying to stay updated on what's coming next. They usually give you you know a notice whether it's weeks or months. So we've been we've known about this one coming up for a couple months now. Um, so we're always you know tuning up our systems to be, you know, top tier, so to speak. But um, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot, a lot to know, especially with Google. But Google is, um, you know, the 800 pound gorilla in the room. So you want to, you know, work within their guidelines. You never want to mess with Google. Yeah. So. All right, Randy, one more thing. Um, where can we see you virtually or in person? Are you doing any conferences? Well, we've been doing a lot of, we've done a bunch of virtual conferences. Um, Got to tell you, I miss the in-person conferences, and we haven't done them as of yet. I'm thinking about the, um, I'm not sure yet, got to check with the wife, but um, I'm thinking about the Midwest Podiatry com Conference. I don't know if that's eight, April or is it June? Maybe somebody else knows. But it's June. It's June. So that might be within reason. You know, um, I, I always like that conference. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting out there. 
Um, well, think- they did just announce that, um, I don't know if you're aware, but it is going to be um, 100% virtual for Midwest this year. Really? So, uh, yeah, because they were on the fence for a little while, I believe. And then we just um, announced, well, we put a, a, a notice on our Facebook wall that it was, it, they made the decision to go virtual this year. But yeah, that's wow. in June. So wow. I was I was definitely disappointed because I live in Illinois and that's usually one right. of the only shows that I get to drive to and see everybody right. eat a little bit easier than other yeah. shows. So yeah, but that's a well, virtual one this year. Maybe we'll have a we'll have a, a dinner in Chicago, get a bunch of podiatrists and have a, a, yeah. a event, you know, that could be There's interesting. A but, few uh, other places that have the best restaurants in Chicago. So. Well, Chicago. You know, I live in New York City, but Chicago is my second favorite city. I love Absolutely. Chicago. Um, we also just purchased my business partner a gigantic brand new RV um, nice. loaded. And we're thinking about using that. You know, we're not right medical, um, but how they've brought their trucks or RVs into the back of the exhibit hall mm-hmm. or they have events in or outside their, their vehicle. So we're, we've got some ideas with that, but, we, you know, might t- t- take the show on the road. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. Oh, it's good stuff. All right, Randy. Well, thank you very much again for your time. Thank you to everyone who joined us live. We really appreciate it. And stay tuned for more goodies and make sure that you reach out to Randy directly if you need pricing information. I've had a couple people ask for that. So I'm referring them um, to you directly. Thank you very much for your time and great questions tonight as well. So all good stuff. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks, everyone.